How many of you are, um, I wonder, preparers? Like you feel prepared for most situations? Like 0.1% or something like that. <laughs> Not too many of you. Uh, what about preppers? Like you are prepped for the worst. Does that you have like a, a case in your home or something that is filled with dry freeze food and enough water to last you and your family for no? No? Me either. It's okay. Well, we are kind of in a season of preparation right now. I'm talking about as the church, as believers, we are in a season where we should be getting ready for something. Passover kind of reminds us of that fact. Looking back through history and through the Bible and reading the stories, Passover was a time of remembrance, celebration, but also preparation. You know, I, I, um, I like to do carpentry and woodwork and update my home and stuff like that. But the issue is that I'm not really the engineer type. And I know we have some engineer types in this room. Those are the types that think through every step, right? And you have plans drawn and you know if you're going to cut something, you know before, ahead of time, exactly the measurements and all this stuff. I'm kind of like a... Uh, make adjustments as I go type of person. So I don't draw out plans. I'm not prepared in that sense. I just have a vision in my mind of what something's supposed to look like. And then I just start making cuts, right? And then I just start going. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's kind of a dumb way to go about things. And you're right, actually. It's not the greatest method, but it's something that works well for me. Sometimes. Usually, mostly, right? But in the, the proper way to do things is you think through what you're doing before you actually do it. That's why we have engineers. That's why we have architects, people to think through the things that the people that are going to get in there and get their hands dirty are going to put together. I don't have that unique ability, that unique skill. But as Christians, we should be thinking through what we are doing, how we are acting, how we are behaving, how we are interacting with people. Because it's part of this greater plan of being prepared. And I'll explain what I mean by that. I'm going to call this sermon, Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord. And you're welcome for all you King James people. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. This phrase is found uh, a few places in the Bible. First is in Isaiah, where the prophet is talking about this time where there would be a person that would make way, make the way for the coming Messiah. Talks about this time where there's going to be the voice calling out in the desert, make way way, make straight the paths, the way of the Lord. And of course, we know that that is John the Baptist, right? If you've read the Bible, the Gospels, every single Gospel has this phrase, I am the one, the voice calling out in the desert, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John was preparing the people for the coming Messiah, And Jesus was preparing the world for a time when he would no longer be here. And what to do in the in-between time of his ascension and his coming back again. This morning we are celebrating Palm Sunday and you may have seen the palm branches in the air as we were worshiping. In John 12, 12 through 16, it says this, the next day, The great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. It says they took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. 
At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written down about him, and that these things had been done to him. This word Hosanna, if you don't know, it means save now. So we have the street lined with people. And just imagine this scene for a moment as Jesus is entering Jerusalem. The street is lined with people and they have these branches and they're saying, save us now, God. And in fact, they're recognizing in that moment that this is their soon or their long-awaited king. This is the one who would come and make all things new in their minds. They didn't quite understand what that meant. Some of them probably thought he was coming to, to overthrow the Roman government and, and to be this great warrior and king. But either way, they had this heart's desire within them saying, save us now, O oh Jesus. And they would lay palm branches on the street. Palm branches, they're the symbol of, of triumph. They're the symbol of victory, the symbol of peace. So in their whole beings and all of their actions, they are recognizing who Jesus is. All the preparations that they'd been doing in their rituals, in their festivals, in their lives, in their hearts, all the teachings, it'd been for this moment where their long-awaited king would come. And today we get to be reminded that our king is here. And also that our king is coming back again. And I wonder, are we prepared for the way of the Lord? Would you pray with me? Father, we worship you in this place, God. We remember how you sent your one and only son, Jesus, God in the flesh, to live amongst us, to teach us, to show us how we need to live. Lord, what to do in the in-between time of your ascension, Lord, and in your coming back again. God, help our hearts to be open this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So how should we as a people now living in, in the post-resurrected time of Jesus, how should we be living? How should we be preparing for the way of the Lord? Well, I don't think this is the answer. I don't think it's that we should be looking to the skies. How many of you know what's gonna be happening April 8th? Right? We, we, we've heard about this, and Indiana just happens to be in the perfect spot, the perfect path of this solar eclipse happens once every 20 years. And I know what happens during these astro, astro, what's that word? The sky stuff in space. During these times, people start to go to scripture and they start to look for the signs in scripture pointing to this sign in the sky and they say, yes, yeah, see, Jesus is coming back. It's interesting, I saw something where it's like the path is going over a few towns and it's like a few Ninevehs and, and all this stuff and it's like we would have never even known those towns existed had it not been for this moment in history, right? And the truth is that Jesus is coming back and everything we are experiencing are like signs of his return, right? That it's not only what's happening in the skies, but what's happening around us all the time. The world is kind of falling apart. And we know that these are the growing pains of the coming Messiah. And so I don't think we, we base what we are doing or what we start doing in our own lives based on what's happening in the skies. And, and maybe it is like a sign of Jesus coming back, you know, the, the day after or something. That's awesome. But I think that in the general sense, we have a job to do between now and the day of the Lord, and we cannot be sidetracked by one event. It says this in Acts 1, 6 through 11, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? 
He said to them, it is this, by the way, this is after Jesus resurrected from the dead and was appearing to his disciples. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Verse 11 says, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, they're they're saying to these men, you're you're standing here, you're looking to the sky, but remember what Jesus just said, you have a job to do. He's going to be coming back. It's going to be in the same way he went. You don't have to stand here expectantly day in and day out just watching because then you're just watching the skies. You're not doing what the Lord has called you to do. You are not preparing for his coming again. What good does it do to you to be looking at the skies? Now, I'm not... I'm not uh, coming down on anyone who's like eagerly anticipating the Lord coming again and getting excited about the solar eclipse. I'm not coming down on you at all. I am excited by, by possibly what that could represent. And scripture does talk about these things, these signs in the heavens, right? So we should be eagerly anticipating and be excited about these growing pains and how things are changing and what's being revealed and the interesting aspect of that. But in the meantime, we have something to do. We have to be preparing. And here's some ways that we can begin to prepare for the day of the Lord when he comes back again. The first thing I I would say is this, that we need to prepare our heart. Now, this isn't about being religious or pious or, or it's not about being legalistic or anything like that, but it's really about being purposeful and mindfully seeking holiness. The greatest thing about you or the most significant thing about you isn't whatever, fill in the blank. It's are you pursuing righteousness and holiness? And all of this stems from the heart. So we may say, how do we do that? Well, we follow the Ten Commandments, right? We look through the Old Testament of Scripture in Exodus and we see that God gave these ten laws for man and this could be a great way to begin to prepare our heart. But we have to remember that the Ten Commandments are great, but Jesus came as a fulfillment of those commandments. We don't negate what they say, but we look to Jesus and say, how are these fulfilled? Now, what does that mean? It means that Jesus reveals the heart behind the commandments. He reveals the intent behind the commandments. So is it good to not murder kids? It's good to not murder, right? Yes, they say yes. But that's the face value of the commandment. There's a heart behind it. There's an intent behind it that Jesus begins to explain to us. And that shows us how we can begin to prepare our hearts. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. On the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, just a a great passage in Scripture. It's really a collection, most scholars agree, it's a collection of Jesus' best sermons, right? That, That they're all compiled together and we understand them as the Sermon on the Mount. And he begins to address the crowds and and he he explains the purpose of the law, the purpose of the Old Testament. He begins to explain how he is the fulfillment of these things. In Matthew 5, 21 through 22, it says this. You have heard that it was said. Again, we're, we're revealing the heart of God here. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, is answerable to the court. That word raka there, it really means basically saying, you good for nothing. 
like looking at your brother or your sister and just putting them down, you know, labeling them that they are worthless, that they, they really shouldn't even be alive. He says, if you say that in your heart, you're subject to judgment. And anyone says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. So as we begin to prepare our hearts for the coming Messiah, we need to understand how we are even talking to people and the words that we place on others and how we are interacting and are we devaluing our fellow brothers and sisters? Because Jesus says, if you do that, it's basically like you are murdering them. And this is heavy stuff, right? Like, because this is something that we all probably have done before. And now imagine like what Jesus would say about that. Man, preparing our hearts for the coming Messiah, it's, it's more than just, you know, playing the good church game. It's more than just understanding what the, the Bible says. It's more than knowing the Ten Commandments, it's more than going through the rituals of things. It's really, what is my heart revealing about who I am? And are the things I'm doing contrary to what Jesus would have me do? Even in the interactions with people that, that I don't like. And this is one example from the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he talks about adultery. He talks about um, just things that it's like, it's so clear and simple in the, in the Old Testament, but when he addresses them and reveals the heart of God's intent, it's like there's so much conviction that takes place, right? Because we all fall short of the glory of God. Preparing our heart means that we are aligning our thoughts, our actions, and our behaviors, hear this, with, with God's intent, We align our hearts, our actions, and behaviors with God's intent. I mean, Scripture has been abused so often, right? People will hold Scripture over you and say, you know, thus saith the Lord, and and they'll use that to address something in your life, and maybe that's not always wrong, but but really we, we should be using Scripture first as a measuring rod of our own lives and looking deep within our hearts and saying, God, where am I falling short? It's interesting that all of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is, is revealing God's intent. And all of it is like way countercultural to to what those people were practicing and believing at that time. And it's relevant for us today. How is your heart prepared? The second thing I would say is we need to prepare our homes. Prepare our homes. All throughout scripture, we see the importance of the family unit. Here's a few examples. When Noah entered the ark, he took his family. Yes, we we know two of every kind of animal, right? But he took his family family. When Abraham left to go to the land, he was promised. He took his, when Lot escaped Sodom, he took his, the righteousness of one impacted the righteousness of others within their families. There is significance in the home or the family unit all throughout scripture. In Acts 11, 14, it says this, Cornelius, who, was, who has received a vision from the Lord and Peter went to, to meet him. I'll just paraphrase. And then Peter reveals that as he went and talked to Cornelius, he said this phrase, he said, and I will give you a message that you and your entire household will be saved. Talking about the power of the word of God to transform, and it starts with this man, Cornelius. In Acts 16, 31, Paul and Silas, they're in prison. They start praying and singing, and the doors just fly open. It's this really great Sunday school story. They're sitting in prison, and you know what they start doing, kids? They start praying, and it says they start singing a hymn. And as they are singing... 
Their praises prompt something in the spiritual realm and the doors open up wide. And you know what that does? The ripple effect of that, the, the people that were witnessing the guards standing there, they, they were so impacted by this miraculous moment. They say, what must we do to be saved? Instead of get back in the prison. How'd you get out of there, silly you? Playing tricks? Oh, Peter says this, you call on the name of the Lord and you and your entire household will be saved. And I read all this and my understanding is that this is the power of the gospel to change and transform. And I don't think it's by accident that we read these phrases about the household, about the families moving together, being transitioned from place to place as God would lead. I don't think it's by accident that that God would give commands to the Israelites that they, they should make altars before the Lord so that they can share these stories for the generations to come. Tell your children so that they will tell their children about the things I have done. I wanna to speak to, just for a moment, the parents with the kids still at home. Proverbs 22, six says this, you will have heard this before. It says, start children off on the way they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Some translations say, train a child up in the way that they should go. So even when they're old, they will not turn from it. This word or this phrase, train up or, or start your children off, it, it's perhaps a better translation is the word dedicate. The word dedicate. Dedicate a child in the way that they should go. Parents with kids still at home, dedicate your children in the way. This is more than just practice, right? This is more than just information. This is more than just ritual. This is like complete investment into the things of God, into your kids, showing them, working beside them, teaching them how to obey. The same word was used when Solomon would dedicate a temple. Imagine the, the care and the intricacies and, and all of the things that went into that. In the same way we dedicate our children to the Lord. We don't just drop them off at Sunday school and say, yes, I've, I've trained my child up this week. We don't just drop them off at, at youth group. We don't just, I've talked about this before. We don't, we, don't, we don't allow others, we don't give the responsibility to others to do all the training and dedicating that we are supposed to be doing. Who is, is, he, is he talking about here in Proverbs? Parents. It's your responsibility. Grandparents, it's your responsibility. Guardians, it's your responsibility. Dedicate. Man, this, this takes time, right? It takes investment. It takes intentionality to dedicate your children. And somehow in the Western church, in the Western culture, we've, we've lost sight of what it really means to pour into our kids the ways and the things of God. And I'm not standing up here telling you that I, I've figured it out and I do it right all the time. No, but as we begin to prepare for the day of the Lord and we prepare our homes, we read scripture like this and we have to take it to heart and what it really means and ask ourselves, Lord, am I doing this? And am I doing enough? And it's more than just instruction and discipline. It's, it's weaving into the very fabric of your lives, care and dedication of your kids to the Lord. Now, speaking to, to parents with grown children, and, and I'll say this, even prodigal children, because statistics show that once kids leave the house, many of them will leave the church, at least for a period of time, many will not come back. And, and I, I want to say with With, I just want to humbly address that. And I want to say that I have people in my own family that, that fall into this category of, of prodigal children, family members, 
cousins. I want to be sensitive to this as well. That you can do everything right as a parent and your kids can still fall away. You can feel like you've done everything right as a parent and still lose your kids anyways. Even if you are the type that really took this Proverbs 22, six to heart and you, you, I mean, you dedicated, you poured into your kids and, and you're asking now, God, why, why, are they, why are they not following you? What did I do wrong? And you know, is it conviction, is it shame? And all these feelings that you experience as a parent of a wayward child. I'll say this, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and the spiritual forces of this world. And the enemy wants nothing more than for your kids to not follow Jesus. And so there's this tension that we experience in this life of people just, of the enemy wanting to just take your kids and sway them and sway their thinking and, and trick them into believing something that is false or something, something that is, is meant to be false, it's actually true, and all these lies that they hear in the rest of the world. And, and listen, that's just the realities of this life. We see this in scripture as well. Think about the kings of Judah and of Israel. Many of them would, would follow the Lord and, and the Bible would say, and they did right by the Lord and, and they remembered his law and his teaching. And then they would talk about how parents, they would raise up their, their heir to the throne and they would teach them in the ways of the Lord. And then the very next verse may say, but they did not follow the Lord and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord or they worshiped the Baals or they, they intermarried when they weren't supposed to. And it's like, well, what, what, what happened? What went wrong? It's just influence. It's just people having this ability to either choose or not. Now, parents with kids at home, does that mean that all hope is lost? That you should just be like, well, is it meaningless? Like, like you would say in Ecclesiastes, is everything meaningless? It's hopeless anyways. Why do I need to do this? Why should I invest all my time? It's not meaningless. And what I would say to you parents of wayward kids, it's not hopeless either. If they're gone if they're experiencing the things of this world, if, if they're experiencing brokenness and, and you have this sense of helplessness, I just wanna remind you and tell you this morning that it is not hopeless. And you still have a duty and you still have a responsibility to pray like never before with, for your kids, like the Bible would say, pray unceasingly. Because listen, church, there is power in Prayer. Often we use this as like, well, it's the, the smallest thing that I can do. Well, at least I can pray. No, that is actually the best, greatest thing you can do, especially when there's a relationship that's severed or they don't want to hear. Well, I can pray for you. I can stand in the gap between you and everything else and cover you in the blood of Jesus. And church, for the rest of us, we have a responsibility and obligation to pray for those as well. So as we prepare our homes, it's an active, active steps towards preparation. We are not to be passive bystanders or just watch how this world's influence and then be hermits in our own place and, and just trust God that he's going to work all things out because he does and he will, but we have a part to play as parents and as the body of Christ. And I'm just reminded of the palm branches, the, the symbol of victory. We could say, that this is, man, I'm going to stand with a palm branch over my home, over my kids, and I'm going to proclaim triumph and victory in Jesus' name. The next thing we can do is, is prepare his church. Philippians 2, 1 through 11 says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if you have any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, 
having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Some translations say being one in spirit and in purpose, and I really like that. Verse three says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name, at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi here. And he's just offering this encouragement as the body of Christ, as the ecclesia, the the gathering of God's people, these are the things that you should be doing. Some highlighted words here, unity, encouragement, common sharing of the spirit, like-minded, same love, one in spirit and in purpose. Value others over yourself. Be like Jesus, humbly serving and even laying down your life. This is what the the church, the body, should be doing. This is what the body should be resembling, what we should be looking like to the rest of the world. We should be embodying these things, these principles, these actions. Overall, we should be striving for unity in this church. I'm not just talking about Life Bridge. I'm talking about the, the, the big C, the church in general. We should be striving for unity, and yet everywhere we look, there's only division. Maybe not only division, but there's so much division between God's people. And I think one thing Jesus would have us do to prepare for his coming is strive for unity. There's gonna be things that we disagree on all the time denominational lines or, or even personal feelings about whatever. And, and we won't always see eye to eye on everything. Jesus created us unique individuals and that is a beautiful thing about us. Yet even though we all have differences, even though we're all unique, even though we all have different political affiliations or, or uh, um family of origins, whatever it is, there's still something that Jesus tells us to strive for, and that is unity. And out of that unity flows encouragement. And out of that unity, we get to experience what a common sharing of the Spirit is. Out of that unity, we we see how like-mindedness is better than the adverse. We get to experience love like never before. We get to move forward in spirit and in purpose on one mission for the gospel. And I don't think Jesus is ready to come back to a church that is not unified. He's waiting for his church to unify. Paul directly addresses this very issue in in the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 3 through 16. There's all sorts of disputes happening. And he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred. And check this out. He says, and you together are that temple. You make it up. Not just one of you not just one denomination. He says, you together are that temple. This building is not the temple housing of the Spirit of God. It's in us. And how can we be a full expression of God's church if there is division among us? So we prepare our hearts 
what are those things that we need Jesus to address within us? What are those practices that we've been doing just out of religiosity that Jesus is saying, no, you think it means this, but it really means this. We need to prepare our homes. How are we raising up our kids to lead the church of tomorrow? How are we actively praying for those that are far off? How are we interceding for, for those family members that are, are living in the world? And then are we actively trying to unify and prepare God's church? And the final thing I would say is this, um, Pastor Sarah, you can, you can come, is that we need to build the body. We cannot overlook or negate our evangelistic responsibility. And I don't know about you, but anytime I hear the word evangelism, I always picture someone on a sidewalk with a megaphone or a microphone screaming at people walking by how they need to repent. Turn or burn, you dirty, rotten sinner, right? That's the image I always get in my mind when I hear the word evangelism. And I think, well, I am not that. (laughs) I'm anything but that. In fact, if I see those people, I usually cross the street. That's not evangelism. It's, it's a piece of it, but we cannot say that that is the definition of evangelism. Evangelism, evangelism is, is how are you connecting with the people around you and what opportunities do you have to share about Jesus with them? Not in a weird way. Some of us can't like get out of being weird. You know, I'm pretty weird. So everything I do is gonna be that, but how can we be like naturally supernatural with people around us? How can we look for opportunities to share about who Jesus is and how much he loves them and how much he cares for them and that he is coming back again? So are you prepared? Are you ready? How many opportunities do we get to do that throughout our day that we miss? The last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples in the Great Commission can be summarized in just two, go and do. In other words, as you are going, make disciples. So evangelism is, all, yes, it's sharing about Jesus, but there's also this, this follow-up to that. And it's, how are you going to commit to discipling? How can you partner with someone else who can do it? We go into all the world and, and we, we share about who Jesus is and all the world is is everywhere, right? We, it's not just across seas or it's not just down in Mexico or it's everywhere, all the world. It's next door. We've talked about this in this place as well. Who are your neighbors? One thing I've been challenging myself with lately is, God, would you just, I've been praying, God, would you show me an opportunity where I can share about you today? And just in, and I just look for moments and conversations. And, but this is a big part of, of preparing for his coming again. This is the church's responsibility, the great commission for every believer. And yet we always, again, we say, well, this is the job of a pastor. This is the job of a missionary. This is a job of the person that has the gift of evangelism. This is the job for the disciples. No, this is our job. Our job is not to just come attend church. My goodness. This is to encourage you to get out. This is to help like sustain you for the rest of the week. We come, we, we worship as a body of believers. We engage in his word. So it can spur us on to do more throughout the week. We don't come just to feel good. Come on. We have a job to do. Man, preparing the way of the Lord is... I'm not saying it's easy, right? None of this is easy. It's easier not to. But if you've been called, you've been chosen. Now we have the information, so what do we do about it?
prepare the way of the Lord.